So let's start with uh, Bruce. Uh, thanks very much. Um, I will start with a case study uh, that really addresses one of the issues that's been raised a number of times today, which is uh, where do you get the money to do this? Uh, so um, I, I have to put this in context. Uh, 35 years ago, a new disease emerged. Those of us on the front lines at the time had no idea what it was. People's immune systems were collapsing, and we slowly came to realize that this was a new virus, HIV, uh, an infection of the immune system, if you will. Virus infects cells. It becomes part of the host genome, and so it's a lifelong infection. And as the virus reproduces itself, it makes huge mistakes, and so the virus rapidly diversifies, orders of magnitude really more than influenza, for which we need a new vaccine every year. So I've spent my career working on, on HIV. I started out as a physician and, and um, became a clinician scientist, really in large part because of the HIV epidemic. We have worked in a number of different areas, um, predominantly in South Africa, right at the heart of the epidemic. And that's where this story about the, the Reagan Institute starts. Um, we were working with a mission hospital there. A, um, the, the detail person, the salesman for their electronic medical record, uh, wanted to, uh, to speak with me and kept asking the, the uh, superintendent there to talk with me for, for close to a year. I go over there every two months, and I always said I don't have time. Finally, the superintendent said, please meet with this person. He just wants to ask you a question. And the question was, uh, I did meet with him, and the question was, would I be willing to meet with the owner of the electronic medical record to tell him that it was saving patients' lives, which it was. They had a phenomenal system, had thousands of patients on treatment at that point, and uh, so I said, sure, I'd be happy to do that. It turned out that that person lived in, uh, in Cambridge, actually at the closest real estate to MGH across the river in Cambridge at One Memorial Square. So I went back to, uh, to Boston and, and over to meet this person, Terry Reagan. And I went in to see him, and he said, I don't really know why you're here. I said, well, I don't really know why either, except I was asked to come and talk with you. I started trying to tell him about his EMR, about the HIV epidemic, and he asked me lots of questions and said he just could not understand why we were trying to build research capacity in Africa when we had all that MIT and Harvard had to offer. And I tried to explain to him that actually there were, there were scientific questions that needed to be asked and could only be asked at the heart of the epidemic. Um, at any rate, I didn't feel like I was really getting through, and I said, well, you should just come over and see it sometime to get a sense of, of what your electronic medical record's really doing, and also it'll give you an understanding of why we're doing what we're doing. Um, so much to my surprise, um, uh, when I got back to my office, his, his assistant had already called to say he was coming with me on my next trip in two weeks. Uh, so I said uh, to my assistant, just make sure we're not sitting together. Uh, that's a really long trip to South Africa, and uh, I want to, you know, I don't want to uh, to impose upon him uh, and vice versa. <laughs> uh, so uh, so he came, uh, and um, when he came to South Africa, we took him not only to see the the Medical Research Institute that we had uh, gotten funding from Doris Duke uh, Charitable Foundation to build. But we also took him to a lot of the ancillary programs that we got involved in, teaching life skills to kids through soccer, et cetera. Um, he had a chance to sit down and see what his EMR was doing, uh, got a sense of, uh, of the impact it was having, and also got to meet some HIV-infected patients who, despite the presence of treatment, were dying of HIV. Um, at that point, um, I, I, on the way over, I'd asked him if his company ever makes any kind of donations because we live off of philanthropy in South Africa. And he said, well, I, I don't want to get your hopes up. My, my, I only, my company doesn't do donations. I do them myself and uh, since I privately own the company. And uh, quite frankly, I want to put my money where it can be leveraged, and I don't think your program is something that would leverage it. Um, so anyway, we... Um, we showed him what we had to show, um, didn't pay much attention to him. Uh, I got my work done and um, decided that on the way back to the airport to drop him off, we would ask him again uh, whether he might be willing to make a donation. And uh, before I had a chance to ask him that, he turned me in the car and said, you know, I don't see how anybody could see what I've just seen and not want to get involved. I'm making lots of money and I don't want to give it to my kids because it would ruin their lives. But I'm sure you have all the money you need from the government. What could I possibly do? So 
at that point, I, uh, I started an education program for, for Mr. Reagan to let him know that that's actually not how things work. And I, I basically expressed my frustration over where we were with the HIV epidemic. Um, and that frustration escalates every time I go to, to, to Africa and see the impact of the epidemic there. Um, the problem is science exists in silos, funding mechanisms discourage innovation. We have not yet applied the full toolbox to HIV, to the HIV problem. There are lots of people out there that would like to contribute who cannot. And if you're, if you're a physicist and want to get a grant to study HIV, good luck if you don't have a track record. Um, and the, the other problem is that scientists are really very rarely empowered to actually make decisions on their own about how funding is going to be used. Um, instead, it's, it's uh, professional uh, program officers at foundations that make those decisions uh, in large part. Um, so I, I, I talked to him at the, uh, at, the, at the airport and said, you know, it'd be great if you could, you know, if you'd like to get engaged with us. Um, what, if we had $5,000, we could buy this piece of laboratory equipment that's really key for our progress. If we had $10,000, we could hire a nurse for this project that we're doing trying to treat, uh, treat children. If we had $20,000, we'd hire two nurses. If we had $100,000, and I sort of kept going, and I, 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 I did something I'd never done before with a donor, which was I thought, well, I'm going to tell them what I really want. And so I said, what I really want to do is try and solve this problem. And I think the only way we're going to do that is to have a long-term strategic plan where we bring people from other disciplines and give them the wherewithal to actually make progress, hold them accountable, but, but, uh, and, and get them to commit to actually working on this problem. So that started a, um, um, you know, he, he said, well, that sounds like it would cost a lot of money, and I said, I'm sure it would, and we then sort of um, um, stopped that conversation. He gave us a, a donation. Uh, a small donation when we got back, and uh, over the course of the next year, he kept asking me about this idea, and I said, well, you know, it kind of formulated in my mind that here at, you know, in Boston with Harvard and MIT, we had all the components that we needed. All we needed to do was get those other people engaged, and, and finally, um, and, and so that was, I, I didn't really think he was serious about this, and then one day he came over to my office and, and uh, uh, unannounced and said that he wanted to talk to me, and basically said it, it sounds to me like you think this is potentially a solvable problem, that you, uh, you think that there are, are uh, approaches that can be applied that are not. You think there are other scientists that want to get involved. It sounds like you need a long-term commitment. It sounds to me like you need about $10 million a year for 10 years. Is that about right? And I said, uh, I said yeah, that's about right, uh, which in retrospect was the wrong answer. Uh, because he then said, uh, well, my wife and I would like to give that to you. And that uh, was kind of an out-of-body experience that uh, I hope to have again sometime. Um, but it, was, uh, it, it really started the establishment of the Reagan Institute. And then with Drew Faust, Susan Hockfield, and Peter Slavin, the presidents of, of uh, Harvard, MIT, and MGH, we embarked on, a, on establishing a memorandum of understanding among the three, institutes, uh, the three institutions uh, to move this forward. Um, and by the end of 2008, uh, after about six months of, uh, of negotiations, um, we, we had our MOU. I should say parenthetically that the deal was we were going to sign this at the Charles Hotel. The appointed time was noon. Um, at a quarter to 12, uh, uh, one of the parties, uh, not Susan Hockfield or Peter Slavin, uh, had not yet signed on to the uh, to the agreement, and um, so there were late-minute phone calls, and basically Terry said, well, um, I'm going to be there at noon, and I'm going to check for $100 million, and um, if the three of them are there, we'll do this, and if they're not, we won't. And they, they all came, and it all got sorted out. So I think there is a leveraging uh, opportunity through the donors them, themselves. Um, at any rate, um, this is a, a, a photograph of the, the actual uh, opening in February of 2009, Susan and Terry Reagan. Terry is a physicist uh, who also co-majored in philosophy at MIT um, and um, had, uh, had an enormous ability to actually make a difference and was looking for something to do. And I think we had um, 
we were fortunate to be able to tell him, um, show him something where we thought he could make a difference. So the, the institute was set up, a $100 million gift over 10 years, $10 million per year, all of it to be spent. Uh, the collaboration, as I mentioned, the mission was, it was not about HIV, but it was broader. But the initial goal was to contribute to the development of an AIDS vaccine. And the plan was to move to Kendall Square by, uh, by four years with, into this effort um, to be closer to the engineers. Um, and, uh, and, and actually, we, we just did that. Uh, another part of the MOU that I didn't insert, but, but if you're ever doing one of these MOUs that I suggested, it, suggest this one because it, it does raise your stock, is that he had, a, he had a couple of out clauses. One of them was if I wasn't going to be the director anymore. So that's a, that's a good one to have in there. Uh, it makes, makes you popular, I think. Um, the government, it, governance was a six-member scientific steering committee. Um, the uh, governance board consisting of the presidents of the institutions plus, uh, plus Terry, and an institutional board that really took care of the nuts and bolts of, uh, of issues that we needed to address. Um, we are now in a 75,000 square foot structure in Kendall Square, a renovated, fac uh, re renovated um, laboratories. Um, we have members and associate members. Um, we have a number of different funding mechanisms, all designed to bring uh, other people into the field. Probably the most effective one has been a fellowship to give an investigator who's never worked on HIV uh, basically hands uh, on the project by hiring a, a, a postdoctoral fellow along with supplies for a couple of years. Um, we also fund strategic initiatives and platform technologies. Um, we're now in this, in this new building. The, the key to this in part, it was actually mentioned earlier, there's free high-end coffee there. You don't have to go and buy it at Pete's, but it's, it's actually, it tastes the same, but it's, but it's free and that really brings people together. Um, and um, I, I think just for some, some brief conclusions from what we've seen is that I think the, the, the success of this, in my, in my view, has been uh, beyond my expectations uh, in terms of what we've been able to accomplish. I think scientists want to collaborate solving big problems, but we're not really set up to address big problems. We're set up to look for grants that keep us going from one cycle to another. Um, Philanthropy is critical for scientific innovation. If there's one Terry Reagan out there, there have got to be many more. And I, I think m many of those people that would have an ability to contribute like Terry actually don't understand how science works and how science is funded. And I think we as a, as a group need to make that uh, case much clearer to people. Um, and so I'll stop there. Thanks.